and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Ashland. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, uh, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell, so everybody gets to do what they like. I'd like doing elder law. Um, and so that's the focus of my work. This show, though, is not about elder law. Um, I do presentations at the Senior Center. If you've ever been there, you, you know that I'm always talking about my friends, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. This show is about Frank and Mary, and it's about the people that Frank and Mary ought to know, the issues they ought to know about, the programs they ought to know about, so they can live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And so that's been the point of the show, and, and because I am not from Ashland, I'm from far away Marlboro, I got this great uh, co-host, Steve Mitchell, who agreed to do the show with me. We've been doing it for like almost a year, I think? Yeah, I for think it's going on a year, so this might be our while. anniversary, actually. But uh, and, you know. and, and so you And so we always find, get these great guests because you always find these people to... And, and then last show, you said... Well, I said uh, last show, so, you know, we've, we've always had, uh, you know, we've had our town manager on, we've had our police and fire chiefs on, we've had our uh, elder services director on, we've had our state rep on. Uh, but uh, last show, we were chatting, and, and I said, you know, this is what Art does all the time. This every day. Is every day. Uh, you know, it, it could be 24-7. So let's interview Art, you know, and let's, let's get a, a measure of, uh, you know, what, who you are, yeah. uh, what your practice is like, what, what precipitated you getting into elder law. And then, you know, let's talk about the issues that, you know, all of, all of us seniors need to be aware of and deal with, uh, whether it's protecting of assets or planning and so yeah. on. So let's start that conversation with a little bit of history about Art Bergeron. So I bought a special tie because you told me I was going to interview, <laughs> right? Because so, I never get interviewed. I like doing these shows because, like you, I have insatiable curiosity yeah. and love to asking other people what they're doing. So uh, brief about me. Uh, I'm going to be 70 in January, right? I like my practice because my clients still think I'm young, right? Among Because that happens. You know, you... I've been practicing for years, for 42 years now, yeah. and but among the folks that I do real estate deals with or developers, people that I've dealt with when I had a smaller practice, they look at me and they're like, you can just see it, like, oh, you're such a dinosaur, you know, right, you know. <laughs> so with, this, with the seniors, that isn't an issue, right? So brief background, I, I grew up in Marlboro. Um, I was the last of six kids. Uh, for those of you from Ashland, who often know where my dad worked, which is over in Framingham. There's a big old estate called Raceland. Um, it was owned by a guy named John Maycomer. It's a hun big 100-acre estate. My dad was the caretaker. So um, I was the last of the six kids and uh, grew up it, on French Hill in Marlboro and went to St. John's on scholarship, St. John's High School, and went to Princeton on scholarship and decided that what I really wanted to do in my life is I wanted to be president of the United States. I was positive I wanted to be president of the United States. You know, I was at Princeton, you know, some people there actually become president Woodrow of the United States. Wilson. Right, so, so I said to myself, right, so what I'll do is I'll go back to my hometown and go back to law school and be a lawyer, not because I liked wanted law, I said, but because they said, well, they make their own hours, pay is good, right? You talked to how a lot of presidents had been lawyers, so I said, okay, I'll do that. Um, so I came back um, and went to BU, went to BU, went to the law school. And third year, I ran for city council and got elected. Um, didn't go to any classes, just got elected. And, th and then uh, was moving right along when I got invited to a New Year's Eve party by one of the people at the newspaper and, and, and went to the New Year's Eve party, only one I ever went to. And there was this beautiful woman there. There was this just beautiful <laughs> woman and, who was a reporter at that time for the Hudson Sun, right? And I was just floored, and we kissed at midnight, and I proposed two months later, and she never had any interest in being the wife of the President of the United States, so my whole life has been Plan B. <laughs> right? I still live in Marlboro. We raised three kids there. They're now all gone, right? One's a lawyer in, in D.C. One's a, one's, um, was, she's my right brainer. She's a, a design person, went to RISD, Redown School of Design. She's in Austin, Texas, and then my son, wants to be a physician assistant, he's in Colorado Springs. So I identify with all these people who have raised kids and now they're all over the place, you know, and you're getting sure. older, right? Yeah. So in terms of this practice, I always had a general practice with the one or two other people in Marlboro. 
uh, from 1977. So you did general law, you general, did real estate transactions, classic uh, local attorney, right? Okay. right? Yep. Me, me, and, and for a while, and for one or two other people, right. and we did. And, we, and so, what do you do to 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 make a living doing that? You do your core is typically real estate. I always had in the states, you know, basic wills and stuff piece. Um, and I always did permitting, right? I, I, which I still do in my hometown. I am, I am the, the big duck in the little pond in Marlboro, Massachusetts. If you, the developers that sometimes show up at your door to get a permit. Right, you still represent. In, in Marlboro, uh, that's me. I'm still the guy, okay. right? But then in, uh, in um, 1991, uh, my mother died um, in a nursing home, uh, having had, she had dementia resulting from these TIAs, these like little mini strokes. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was call, it's still called the you know, hardening of the arteries, the term Alzheimer's, only it was occasionally used back then. But I watched it play out. You know, I watched her at home with my dad and her getting her memory was worse and worse, and she was really shy. So she would just get quieter and quieter, and my father would get more and more frustrated that my mother couldn't remember um, and, that, and that she would be afraid when he would leave the house right. because she couldn't, we didn't know where he was, you know. Yeah, that's such a... a, a uh an important uh, point to make that, you know, as you describe it uh, with your uh, experience with your parents, there wasn't a lot of awareness of these no. conditions, these illnesses. So, so consequently, little. you know, our response to them as, as caretakers, as spouses, as children, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, by today's standards, Unusual, and you were so in the dark, right. and you'd never ask anybody because at that time Alzheimer's disease was not a disease; it was just an embarrassment. It was like, oh, you know, Ma's. So, so people would stop visiting, you right. know, or less people would visit, you know. And my mother would not get out of the house, and you, and it would just watch the whole thing. You just watch right. the whole thing play out. So, fortunately, really there's hard. there's a lot more awareness today in our yes. in our universe. Yes. And, uh, so and, and by the way, that's why I started doing elder law. That became an increasing piece of my practice. Right. And then 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, 10 years ago in January, I moved to Myrick O'Connell because the folks there, it's a multi-specialty firm. So mm -hmm. they have people who do pretty much a lot of stuff, you know, corporate and personal injury and all this stuff. But they, and, and they had trust in estates people who typically dealt with estate planning. That is, what happens to my assets after I die? As opposed to elder law, that is, how am I going to do while I'm alive? Right. <laughs> right. That's kind of like the distinct. And so they wanted somebody to focus on that, and I've done that ever since. I love this. Great. And that's what we need to focus on today is, yeah. is the elder law components and, uh, you know, while we are alive. And, you know, I have to say you look great for 70. Sorry. I just turned 70 myself. <laughs> well, that, yes. I don't know if I look as, you know, I will let the audience decide that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, it's as, as folks are aging, as folks are making that decision to uh, get into, uh, move towards retirement. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently retired. Yep. My wife is not, but soon to be soon within to be. the next year, year and a half. So you're figuring um, all that stuff out. So we're figuring yep. out the kind of individual aspect of retirement, mean, meaning w w what am I going to do with my days? Uh, separate from you know, what are we going to do as, as a couple and as we move through retirement, into retirement, and then process all that? So, yep. you know, speak a little bit about how that's evolved in your, in your process. Sh sure. And, and when, I, when I talk to folks about it, that's one of the reasons why I kind of invented Frank and Mary. Um, Frank and Mary uh, look a lot like my parents, actually. They were drawn by my paralegal son, right? They were as, as car kind of cartoon characters, mm -hmm. but they really look a lot like my folks. And, and I, I, I'm constantly dealing with folks who are, so they're in that whole period, really starting at about 70. They're, at th you know, from 70 to dead, right? That's kind of the, those are my clients. And, and one of the things that, they, they, that you come to appreciate is that as opposed to what young people think about old people, which is they're all just old, right? Just like when we look at kids and they all, you know now our age, you see people like 20 or 30, or they all look like the same age, you know? They're just like <laughs> young, right? They all look like my, could be my grandchildren. Yes, yes, point, it, right? it is like the reverse of when you were a little kid and you saw anybody over like 20 was just like this old person, right? So, so once you get to be here, you realize we're actually different, you know, that the people 70, 80, 90, and people during those times, um, they are going, they are probably in different situations physically as well as mentally. 
um, you know that you're in the period of time where you know what the end means, and the end is dead, right? And so there are a whole bunch of different routes to and death. And it's going to last a long time. We, and, uh, and, and it may, and it may last a long time. And as, and as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I try to emphasize with people is that when people come in and they're talking about doing this, any of this kind of estate planning, or, or when we talk about you know, nursing home care or, or this possibility of frailty, people's greatest fear, they'll always say, oh, I just want to drop dead. And, I, and I'll remind them, and I, no, I actually remember of course, when we were growing up, that's what would happen, right? You would, you'd get old, you'd have a stroke, you'd have a heart attack, you'd die. Remember, you, you'd hear people that, how they died, they got a, had a stroke, they died, right? And, and it doesn't seem to happen anymore. And one of the, I saw the statistic that kind of documented that. that they said that, that when you, in 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, your likelihood of being dead within two weeks was 33%. Percentage, it's now 3%. Right. So the obviously change. the advances the in health care, the advances in, you know, just the public safety components in general has... Yeah, great, right? great EMTs, local, local right. departments, so, they're, they're you know, response times, all, all of those yeah. things. Awareness yeah. uh, among the public. I mean, you know, many people today know CPR practices, right? So, uh, so, But as a result of that, you need to be planning more for this possibility that one of those things might happen to you. Right. But you might not be dead. <laughs> well, that's you right. may be disabled. And right? you know, so we, we, we're, I'm going to classify both yeah. of us obviously as baby boomers. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and you know, we've provided some positive things to our world. Not we hope not we hope. everything positive, but uh, you know. So one of the things that we have uh, provided, I think, is is this uh, extension of life in a sense, right? Uh, right. You know, I just, I think we all think about, uh, you know, when we were 20 years old and we looked at somebody that was 60, it was a very different perception. That was a different 60. Right? Yeah. It was a different 60. So I think yeah. we all recognize that 60 is very different today, 70 is very different today, and so on. And, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the likelihood of us living longer than our parents obviously is dramatically greater today. You know, so, so how, do we, how do we plan for that? How do we plan for our, uh, the process of living longer, yep. uh, but also planning for the, the eventuality of death relative to wills and, and assets yep. that, that we've accumulated over a lifetime? So let me, let, me, let me talk about that a little bit, because I'll talk to you about, as I had suggested, <coughs> the, what ends up happening is you have these different situations, you know. You have folks who come in to talk to me, they're 70. Yep. And they, they'll say, well, you know, I really want to, we really want to, at this point, we're not really worried about nursing home type issues, right, because we're 70. And we know that we know people who have had problems, some young, but usually older, right? So our issue is we're coming in, we want to make sure that if we die, um, that our kids are not going to have to go through this big hassle, right? Because we want it, when we die, we want our assets to be liquidated, which means turned into money and divided up. That's all we want. And we want, we don't want to pay the government any tax money, you know. We don't want to pay the law, you don't want to pay me more money, you don't want to pay a lawyer more money. What do we do? And, I, and what I'll tell these folks when they come in is, you know, we can structure things so as to avoid probate, but you probably already have. If you're married, Chances are you own your assets jointly with rights of survivorship, and the legal consequence of that is that if one of you, uh, that you each own 100% of the asset. So if one of you dies, that person's interest evaporates, the other person becomes the owner of yes. the bank account <coughs> or the house. Right. Usually for the assets that aren't owned that way, like annuity, an annuity that you may have or some other stuff, um, or, or your tax deferred money, your IRA, your 401k plan, there is a named death beneficiary, right? None of those assets will go through probate when you die. So chances are, if, if you are in the kind of the traditional marriage situation, right, that, that you don't have to worry about avoiding probate until somebody has died. And the likelihood that you're both gonna die at the same time, right, or that, you're gonna, or that one of you is gonna die before the other one can, and, and the other one's not gonna have time to change plans, is very remote. I've had cases, actually I had a couple in Ashland, that died within a week of each other, right? But they were both in their 80s or low 90s. You know, that's a very rare circumstance. Right. So what I'll tell yeah. folks in, when they're younger is, for, if that's your issue, 
I can take care of it, right? I can structure things because when the second person dies, if that happened, if one person dies, the other person becomes the owner, and then the next, that second person dies right away, those assets will need to go through the probate process. So if they want to avoid things ahead of time, they can by, by creating this revocable and amendable trust, naming themselves as the trustees, saying in the trust, well, when one of us dies, the other one becomes the sole trustee and is totally in control. So it's just like when you owned it jointly. But then you'd say, when the second person dies, I'm going to name a third party, typically one of your kids, right. as the yep. successor trustee. And if you structure things that way, then you will have avoided that probate. I only suggest to people, you can do that now, but you can also wait. You can wait until one of you has died, and then the survivor can come and talk to me, and we can do all that stuff then, right? The two things I tell people when you're younger, when you're our age, you have to have. You have to have. You have to, they're, and they're cheap documents to get. Power of attorney, healthcare proxy. You're right. You have yep. to have them, right? You need, yep. because if you've had that little stroke, and you are disabled, whether, which is the likely case, you're only disabled for a little while, right. or in some sad cases, you're disabled for a long while, you need somebody who can go to the bank for you, who can deal with your insurance company, who can deal with the millions of people, not millions, but the many people who, who won't deal with, with somebody on your behalf unless that person has this power of attorney. And so I tell people that. I say, you have to have a power of attorney, and if you already have one, because you were when you did it when you were younger, chances are you didn't name an alternate. You just named your spouse. You get to our age, you want to make sure there's an alternate, right? Because you know if you if you have a stroke and you're in the hospital, does your wife really want to be out no. dealing with the insurance company? No, you want somebody else Good that point. can do it. it. My wife and I just recently, when I say recently, within yeah. the last two years, yeah. had our wills drawn yeah. up. Yeah. Power of attorney, proxy, healthcare proxy. Yeah. Uh, but also, they, the lawyer that we used recommended a, um, uh, filing our, our home as, um, as a homestead. Doing a homestead. So speak to that. So let me t okay, so let me talk about homestead. But by the way, once again, on healthcare proxy, yep. same thing. Get an alternate. Make sure, I bet your attorney even talked to you about that. Make sure that there's some backup. So we, right? it, exactly yeah. the case. So, yep. we, you know, everywhere, all the documents have that, that backup. Right, so. right. So let me talk about homestead for a second. So the point of Homestead, home, Homestead was, the concept of the Homestead was created about a thousand years ago. It was an English, English concept. And the idea was to make sure that, kind of one of a better term, no matter how much drinking you did as the husband who owned the farm, right, the creditors couldn't come and throw your wife out, right? So you, you had this ability regarding the property that you owned to file, it, to file a document that, that it, declaring a Homestead on the property for yourself your spouse and your minor children. And once that homestead was created, um, a creditor, even if it was a legitimate creditor and had a legitimate claim on your estate, mm -hmm. right, could file an attachment on your property, but they couldn't force a sale of the property to pay off the debt while you were alive, while you were alive and while your children were under, were under age 18. And that is, that is still the structure of the homestead. Right, so the, the the purpose of the homestead is to make sure that you don't lose your house. Right, it does not, contrary to, to public belief, mean that a creditor of yours cannot attach your property. Right. They right. can. It just means they can't force the sale. Force the sale right. Right. until you're dead. And until you, you're dead. And, and and the other thing that's important about that was that is that that means if you've got that homestead and that creditor shows up and they attach your property and you want to sell your property. You're going to have to pay the creditor, right? To the to the extent that your homestead, the 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 value of your homestead is lower than the total value of your right. house. So there okay. still may be a liability. So a homestead is important. It's very important when you're younger, right? Uh, in my opinion, the importance of the homestead diminishes as you get older, and the reason is because the likelihood of creditors diminishes as you get sure. older, but, right? But do you still recommend always. that? Always, yeah. Always, always, because it, as a matter of fact, there's, a, there's actually a, uh, um, um, many, many insurance companies will tell you, lawyer, uh, for lawyers, right. will say it's actually um, malpractice. For, it's negligence for you to not recommend right. that your client have a homestead. So for those uh, seniors out there that actually literally don't have wills or have the structure in place, so yeah. the, 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 the most important components of the planning would be yeah. a, a will, 
a health care proxy, power of attorney, homestead. Now, I'm just going to step back. If you're single, if you're single, right, it is very important. It, it may be important to have a will, right? If you're married and all of your assets are owned jointly, you don't need it. You don't need it. And I know that I'm saying something, it's kind of counterintuitive because people will often come in and say, you know, I really, really need a will. And I'll kind of go through their asset situation and say, well, do you, know, do you really need a will? So, so no, let, let me just step back and talk about that sure. for a second. So <coughs> if you die owning, the, so it's the point of a will. If you die owning something in just your name, um, then the legal system has to figure out who gets it, right? Um, and that is the point of the probate process. When people talk about, well, what is probate? That's the point. There are separate probate courts that des are designed to do only a certain set of things. Their biggest task is to do divorces. They also do name changes. They do guardianship. They do things that are associated with the family. That was the kind of the theory behind them. But among other things, they'll do probate. So, so if I die and I own a house, and the house is just in my name, then somebody has to go to the probate court, file a petition with the probate court that says, either I had a will or I didn't, right? I'm dead, I own this property, and we need to figure out who owns it, right? And now I'm gonna file that petition in the probate court, and then the probate court at some point is, is going to uh, accept that, right? They're gonna decide whether the will I file is really the last will and testament, not the second of the last will and testament. They're, if I don't have a will, they're gonna they still be, allow me to file. And then, after at least a year, the probate court is going to allow the distribution of those assets that are going through probate. Now, if I died, now, and by the way, the reason for that year is that probate is designed for two purposes. It's designed to make sure the right people get the assets. It's also designed to make sure the creditors get paid because creditors get paid before anybody else gets paid. That was the kind of the right. point of the system. And creditors of yours have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. So one of actually the goals when you're trying to avoid probate is if you've got creditors, mm -hmm. you can wipe them out just by not having assets that go through probate. So at the end of that period, the end of that year, a year and a day after you died, then the assets can be distributed by the person who was named by the court as the, the executor. It used to be called the executor. Now it's called the personal representative. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you have a will, then that pers personal representative is supposed to go read the will and distribute the assets. If you don't have a will, the Commonwealth has written a will for you, right? And it is called the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply when there is no will. Now, I'm going back to my Frank and Mary case, right? If Frank is dead, if Frank and Mary are both alive and one dies, the other one gets all the assets. Frank's dead and Mary's now owns these assets. And, and, her, and what she wanted was that when she died, her assets would be divided equally among her kids. And she dies and the things go through probate. At the end of the day, and she doesn't have a will, that's exactly what's gonna happen. The assets are simply gonna be divided among right. the kills. So in that situation, Mary didn't benefit from having a will. Right? The exact same thing happened that would have happened if she didn't have a will. What Mary, the reasons why Mary would want a will would be if that wasn't exactly what she wanted to have happen. If she had a disabled child, so she wanted money and trust to be in trust for that benefit of that disabled child. If one of her children was dead and she wanted to make sure that the grandchildren were taken care of. If there was a blended marriage, if there is a blended, right. and there are kids from two different families, then that's not what happens. The, not, the rules of intestacy are different. In those cases, Mary might want a will. And th that's the reason why you want to talk sure. to your lawyer, right? You want, you want to yeah. kind of, you want to figure that out, yeah. right? And you want to figure out at that point whether you want to avoid all of that probate process by having a trust, by having a revocable and amendable trust, may, keeping yourself as the trustee so you're totally in control while you're alive but knowing that at the moment of your, the day after you die, one of your kids can step in, sell the house, divide up the money, it's all done. Right, right. So believe it or That's not, fine. we've almost used up our time, <laughs> yeah. but you, there's still more to talk about here. I know that. So we may need another show. I'm yeah. just warning you that this might be. And I wasn't meaning to run, you know, no, lawyer, well, is, you become a lawyer because you like talking. This is, you know? well, this is important uh, right. information. So, and we really even, haven't even really, um, discussed some of the f financial components of, 
of planning while you're so I think while we you're may, still alive while you're still alive and uh, so I think we may need to save that for the next show and be just continue this yeah, yeah. I'll and be do glad a two parter I'll be glad now I'm just going to mention one other, I just wanted to mention one yeah. other thing though because I you know <clears throat> a lot of times people come to me and they're kind of surprised by the advice that they're getting because it's not kind of what they Intuitive. expect Intuitive. that's right it's not yeah. what they expect. So actually we're doing, I'm gonna be at the Senior Center today yeah. doing a presentation with a group of people, a doctor and a, a geriatric care manager. We're talking really about Mary, uh, in the pretend Mary, and we're pretending that she is 90 in the first part, and at the end we're pretending that she's, she's in the last year of her life. And we're talking, and, and my piece, there are a bunch of pieces of that presentation. There are some medical pieces, there are others. There's a piece that's legal. And so I'm just going to mention what I tell folks then is, is that, f first of all, that's the time of your life when, regarding some of these documents, you want to make sure those documents are right. You want to make sure that that health care proxy and the power of attorney is right so that that person really knows how you want to be treated. The second thing I, I'll mention to folks is to the extent that you are, like many of my clients, that you never wanted to set up any of those trusts and do any of that other jazz, and now you find yourself with these assets, mm -hmm. and you've got a house, and you've got some bank accounts and stuff, and 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 but you don't really feel like having to do something right now. You don't feel great, right? Well, if you've got that power of attorney, right, and you've named somebody as your attorney, what you may do, have done, or what you should have done with that person, was to say to him, "Look, um, if I get sick, and it looks like I'm going to die, right, take my assets." which you can do, you have my power of attorney, and distribute them, just distribute them. Take my bank account, give the money to the three kids, right? If I still have a house, you have my power of attorney, you have the ability to sign a deed for me. Take my house, do something called a, a remainder interest, transfer a remainder interest in my house to the kids, with, keep, leave me with a life estate so that when I die, for tax purposes, the kids are gonna get the benefit. But, the, but it's going to avoid probate. The, if you have that power of attorney, it's so simple, and you, and you give your attorney these instructions, right. your attorney at the last minute, and when I say your attorney, the person that you've named to take care of things for you, not your lawyer, right, but your attorney, can take care of all this for you, right? And, and that's the reason why kind of the, you know, the, the, the bottom line theme of this, right, is don't assume you know the law, right? I don't assume I know medicine. I don't assume. Sure. I don't know how to fix my car. Don't assume it. Talk to somebody. Right. It may be that you're not going to have to spend a lot of money in legal right. costs to help figure this stuff out. So great part, great yeah. discussion. Part one. Part one. Part two next month. Uh, important to continue this. Yeah. Uh, important also to make note that Art does spend time at the Ashland. Community Center with uh, with the seniors doing programming uh, and providing this information. Um, and another important uh, note to make, uh, November 20th is our special town meeting, Ashland High School, 7 p.m. Uh, it's the, the yearly uh, authorization of our 41 C and a half senior exemptions. So uh, if you are need, uh, uh, or qualify for those exemptions. That's when we do uh, when we do uh, uh, do the authorization at town meeting. So if you're able to get to Ashland High School, November the 20th, 7 p.m. Special town meeting. So because thank you because you. you have a stake. That's you right. Have a stake. So thank, thank you, you very Art. Much, a, pleasure a pleasure having this always, conversation. Always a pleasure. Part two next month. Next time we'll talk a little bit more about uh, other related stuff. Very related good. stuff. Thank Great. you. Thank you.